this first slide is just in tribute to, uh, to John Jane. The picture on, on your right is uh, uh, of Lake Louise in Banff, and that's where I met John uh, for the first time, and that was at a meeting in uh, uh, 1987. And uh, that's probably before a lot of you, or some of you at least, were, were born. So I'd known John, I had known John for a long time. He's a great educator, and I hope that we can uh, sort of uh, follow in his footsteps. Uh, so the, the talk uh, today is about SUR1 TRPM4. This is an ion channel uh, that we discovered now uh, nearly two decades ago, around the turn of the century. And it was discovered in uh, patch clamp experiments that I'll show you. Uh, and uh, that story has now gone from this very fundamental basic science discovery all the way through uh, clinical trials uh, that are ongoing and we'll touch upon each aspect of that as, as, uh, as we proceed over the next hour. But, but just to explain what this conformational change business is, um, I'll get used to this pointer in a moment. Uh, so conformational change in, uh, uh, in patch clamp experiments, that's where one molecule is being studied or recorded electrophysiologically, and when that molecule undergoes a conformational change, that channel opens or closes. And, and that was the original discovery. So we've gone from, as I say, a conformational change in a single molecule uh, all the way to uh, clinical trials. Uh, necessary presenter disclosure information. Uh, Remedy NIH, Remedy Biogen NIH uh, VA grants. Uh, so I want to set the, uh, the background for this talk uh, with this slide and the next one. This is a case that actually came in uh, last week. And uh, this is a, uh, a case where uh, this lady came in with a hemiparesis, uh, had uh, a, uh, an occluded uh, uh, circulation, uh, underwent mechanical thrombectomy, uh, restored the circulation, and as you see here, she had uh, a carotid, uh, uh, a, um, um, she, she needed a carotid endarterectomy, which I did again last week. Uh, so so the, the, the issue here is uh, reperfusion injury in the uh, age of revascularization. So uh, how long can we wait and how big a stroke can you have before it's uh, unsafe to uh, revascularize? And, uh, uh, and, and what are the consequences of uh, reperfusion injury that uh, can occur? Uh, and uh, th these are the, uh, uh, some of the consequences of reperfusion injury as currently understood. Uh, basically, it's thought to occur uh, in uh, three stages. Uh, there's initially a uh, uh, hyperemia stage, which is uh, related to the fact that there's been ischemia and uh, hypoperfusion, and there's an increased metabolic demand, uh, and that leads to hyperemia. But then the activated endothelium uh, uh, starts to manifest its, uh, uh, its injury, and there's endothelial cell activation, and we sh we'll be showing you some of that, what that, the consequences of that at a cellular and molecular level are. And, and there can be swelling of endothelial cells that leads to what's been termed over the years uh, the no reflow phenomenon. So even though there's recanalization, there may not be reperfusion. And eventually there's a breakdown of uh, blood-brain barrier and uh, edema, inflammation, possibly hemorrhagic transformation. So those are the consequences. And as you all know, recanalization of, a, of an infarct that's uh, either too old or too large uh, can lead to these kind of problems of uh, reperfusion. So the question is, is there a role uh, for the SUR1 TRPM4 channel that we'll talk about this morning in this physiology, pathology of uh, reperfusion uh, injury? The concepts that I want to talk about this morning, we'll cover each one of them with a few slides, uh, are listed here just to give you uh, 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 sort of a, uh, a, 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 an introduction to the different concepts. So we'll start by talking about the channel basics uh, with this slide. I like to introduce the channel, the SUR1 TRPM4 channel, by putting it in the context of the KTP channel, which, uh, as you all know, controls insulin release in the uh, 
in the pancreas. So the KTP channel is made up of two different subunits, SUR1, sulfonyl urea receptor 1, and a pore forming subunit, KIR 6.2. K stands for potassium, IR, inward rectifier, 6.2 is, is the, is the uh, designation. This channel, when it opens, allows potassium to flow out of the cell, and that causes uh, hyperpolarization of the cell, as you see here. And channel opening is, uh, is, uh, occurs when there's a depletion or a reduction in ATP. And this, again, is uh, related to the uh, uh, insulin secretion in the pancreas. There are KTP channels in the brain uh, uh, as well, but uh, the, the one in the pancreas is the best understood one and the one for which uh, drugs have been developed over the years. Some of the drugs that have been developed over the years for treating adult onset diabetes actually target this channel, the KTP channel, and those drugs are sulfonylurea drugs, first generation being tolbutamide, second generation being glibenclamide or gliburide. Glibenclamide, gliburide, same mo uh, molecule, just two different names. And uh, that has been used, uh, of course, for three decades or so for treatment of adult onset diabetes to help promote uh, insulin uh, secretion. Now, the channel that we discovered some time ago is uh, the SUR1 TRPM4 channel. So SUR1, sulfonylurea receptor 1, is precisely, is exactly the same regulatory subunit. What's different about the channel is the pore forming subunit, TRPM4, uh, and, and instead of being a potassium selective channel, this allows sodium to enter the cell. So when this channel is open, sodium enters the cell. That causes cell depolarization, uh, as you see in, in, um, in this lower uh, portion right there, cell depolarization. So same regulatory subunit, different pore-forming subunit, diametrically opposed physiologic action, hyperpolarization versus depolarization, okay? Uh, but the consequence of being the same regulatory subunit is the drugs that were developed, again, to treat adult onset diabetes like Glyburide can now be used in the context of uh, CNS injury, as we'll show you, uh, to treat uh, 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 brain swelling and in stroke and other things. So this channel, as I mentioned, was discovered uh, again nearly two decades ago in patch clamp electrophysiology experiments, and you see an example depicted here. So patch clamp, to remind you, uh, uh, is uh, a, a way of studying uh, cells. You start with a very fine tip pipette, roughly a micron or so in diameter, and you uh, you you bring that uh, pipette tip to the surface of a cell, and that one micron diameter tip can be uh, uh, lying over an ion channel, and you can record the ion channel activity uh, from uh, 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 that, that's present in that uh, patch and look at the opening and closing of the channel. When we first started doing these experiments, we were studying uh, reactive astrocytes, and we'll show you some of that in just a moment. Um, and when we would do the patch, attaching the pipette to the cell membrane, we would see nothing, and then we would rip the patch off and with the, uh, the idea of going on to another cell, but then as soon as you rip the patch off, the patch would uh, start uh, uh, showing activity. And uh, lo and behold, it turned out that uh, uh, we realized that the patch was quiescent when the patch was still attached to the cell because there was ATP within the cell that was keeping the channel closed. And when we would rip that patch off of the cell, expose it to a bath solution with no ATP, the channel would begin to uh, become active. And you can see that uh, here, you see that under control conditions after you've ripped the patch off the cell, there's a lot of activity uh, on uh, 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 in that patch. If you put AMP or ADP, nothing happens, but you add ATP to the cytoplasmic side of the patch and it becomes quiescent again. And, and you can wash the ATP out and have the channel uh, uh, start uh, showing activity again. And the concentration response relationship for uh, ATP is shown here, and that uh, half uh, EC50 value is around 0.8 or, or so uh, micromolar. So the channel is opened by depleting ATP. So think about it. The, uh, this is the kind of thing that happens in the context of stroke that ATP gets run down, and when ATP runs down, uh, that will cause the channel to open. 
And if you restore energy, um, that can quiet the patch or the channel. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the channel is regulated by sulfonylurea receptor 1, and therefore first and second generation sulfonylureas, first generation tolbutamide, second generation glabinclamide, uh, block the channel uh, at roughly the same uh, potency as is seen for KTP channels in pancreatic beta cells. But we know this is not a KTP channel because these recordings are all made with cesium, which blocks potassium channels. And so uh, this is a characteristic feature of so-called non-selective cation channels that they allow cesium and other ions to, to permeate. So, uh, so when is this channel uh, expressed and under what conditions? Well, first I'll tell you that the channel is not, not normally expressed in any cell as far as we know. Uh, that may be a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's fundamentally true. Uh, that it's basically not uh, expressed, as far as we know, in, in any cell of the CNS or elsewhere. But when there's an injury situation, either ischemia or trauma or uh, inflammation, uh, other situations such as this, the channel becomes transcriptionally uh, upregulated. And uh, uh, to bring this back to our ischemia reperfusion, uh, the reperfusion uh, phenomenon, uh, phenomena that we were talking about earlier, these are experiments in which we look at what happens uh, when there is ischemia reperfusion. And one of the fundamental things that happens is that uh, uh, there is activation of the endothelium, which is characterized in part by upregulation of the transcription factor NF-kappa B. Uh, and what we're showing here is the uh, labeling uh, for P65, one of the factors uh, of uh, the NF-kappa B uh, multimer. And you see that uh, total uh, P65 as well as nuclear P65 in the microvasculature is tremendously increased. And at the same time, and one of the earliest responses we see is that SUR1 is upregulated in these uh, uh, microvessels following reperfusion. This is a two-hour ischemia, one-hour reperfusion experiment. And you see these elongated structures in the cortex of this rat uh, brain. And you see that when we label them, uh, SUR1 is very prominent and double labeling for von Willebrand factor to convince you that this is a microvessel. And when we uh, replicate this in vitro uh, with endothelial cell cultures. We see that uh, ABCC8, which is the gene that encodes SUR1, uh, is activated by NF-kappa B, as is TRPM4, and there's upregulation of the transcripts for the uh, uh, channel subunits. And when we record these cells electrophysiologically, we see that there's uh, expression now of a channel. Uh, after activation. Now it's very important. In uh, what's called a control here, uh, ATP depletion does nothing to the, uh, to the cell, uh, but when the cell is activated uh, with uh, exposure to uh, an activation through NF-kappa B, uh, now uh, ATP depletion causes this uh, uh, channel to be expressed and the channel to open. And this is characterized as the uh, su one trpm 4 channel here at a whole cell level and at a single channel level blocked by glibenclamide. So activation of endothelium through NF-kappa B as occurs in uh, ischemia reperfusion, very important for upregulating the uh, su one trpm 4 channel in the microvasculature. Turns out that the channel is also upregulated in other cells of the neurovascular unit later on, microvasculature first, and foremost, uh, but later on, astrocytes, uh, neurons, uh, as well as oligodendrocytes, all express SUR1. Uh, these uh, 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 images here in red are showing SUR1 upregulation, and the green images are the cell type specific neurons. It's NEUN, astrocytes, GFAP, and so forth. Uh, but you see this uh, uh, in, again in the microvasculature, emphasizing co localization of SUR1 and uh, TRPM4, showing that they are, are both expressed there. This experiment down below is showing uh, something called FRET. That's first to resonance energy transfer. When you have two molecules that are very close to each other, and if they are uh, uh, responding to a fluorescent uh, uh, input, the uh, energy from one molecule that you're using to excite it 
can radiate, uh, can uh, transfer non-radiatively to the adjacent molecule if those two molecules are close enough and, uh, and emit at the frequency of the second fluorescent uh, probe. So this is another way of showing that SUR1 and TRPM4 are uh, co-assembled uh, in vivo. And these are uh, co-IP experiments showing that SUR1 and TRPM4 in the context of ischemia reperfusion uh, co-associate, whereas they don't uh, prior. Um, we uh, do these kind of experiments not only in mice and rats, but we do them in humans. Uh, this is an example of tissues obtained from a patient who underwent uh, decompressive craniectomy for stroke. We sampled biops uh, biopsy specimen, and we showed that uh, those tissues uh, ex expressed SUR1 and TRPM4 in the uh, vasculature, and the FRET signal showing co-assembly in the human brain is, uh, is shown to the, to the right. So what, what, does, uh, what does this channel do? So one of the very important things that the channel does is has a role in cell swelling. Uh, there, there are two cells that we'll focus on. One is astrocyte and role of the channel in cell swelling in the astrocyte. And the other is endothelium. We've touched on that. We'll get into it again in just a moment. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about cell swelling here. These are experiments that we did uh, quite some time ago. These are uh, uh, scanning electron micrographs of uh, freshly isolated reactive astrocytes from the rat brain in suspension. And you can see that uh, under control conditions, they have all these delicate processes at the surface. But if you poison the mitochondria with sodium azide, uh, the result of which is that ETP will be depleted, you see that they start to exhibit these blebs on the cell surface. This is at five minutes, and this is at 25 minutes. You see these blebs forming at the, uh, at the cell surface. What is happening here is that the ATP depletion is causing opening of the channel. The channel, as I mentioned, allows sodium to influx to come into the cell. Uh, with sodium coming in, in order to maintain electrical neutrality, chloride will come in. And in order to maintain osmotic neutrality, water will come in. So salt water is pouring into the cell initiated by permeation through the SUR1 TRPM4 channel. And that causes the cell to swell and, and bleb. And this is a process we call cytotoxic edema. And here is the molecular mechanism, one of the me molecular mechanisms for the development of cytotoxic uh, edema in, uh, of, of astrocytes. Now, we can replicate that kind of experiment, as is shown here, using uh, phase contrast micro microscopy instead of scanning electron microscopy. You see that under control conditions, uh, the cells are very happy. Uh, they maintain their appearance. Uh, uh, but if you, if you uh, again, poison the mitochondria with sodium azide, you see that over the course of the next 30 minutes or so, they develop these blebs on the cell surface as sodium and chloride and water are pouring in. Now there's a drug uh, called diazoxide, which uh, actually uh, 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 activates SUR1 channels. You may have run into this and it was called, it used to be called uh, potassium channel openers because they would open KTP channels, but they act on SUR1 and so can be made to open the SUR1 TRPM4 channel. And so even without ATP depletion, if you just open the channel, as is shown here, just opening the channel without ATP depletion is enough to cause this cytotoxic edema blebbing of the uh, cells. And finally, if you do this kind of experiment, uh, uh, deplete ATP with sodium azide, but do it in the presence of glybenclamide or gliburide to block the channel, even though ATP depletion is occurring, there's no blebbing, no cytotoxic edema. Now, uh, astrocytes, as you know, express uh, another channel, the water channel, aquaporin-4. And this is another story that has evolved over the last decade, very important story of aquaporin, uh, the, the role of aquaporin in brain swelling, brain edema. And so we wondered if there was a connection. And uh, Jesse uh, Stokum, who's a graduate student, uh, is finishing medical school now, MD, PhD student, uh, did these experiments that I'll show you in the next couple of slides. Uh, 
So in these experiments, he was expressing SU1, TRPM4, and Aquaporin 4. And Aquaporin has two uh, isoforms, M1 and M23. And as you see in these experiments, when you express uh, TRPM4 and Aquaporin 4 and immunoisolate using an antibody against Aquaporin 4, you can immunoblot for TRPM4 and see that TRPM4 has come down, has uh, co-immunoprecipitated with uh, Aquaporin. Same thing with SUR1 and Aquaporin 4. They co-associate, co-assemble uh, together. And most interesting, when you do this kind of experiment in the absence or presence of SUR1, you see that the amount of TRPM4 that you uh, bring down when you immunoisolate Aquaporin 4 is increased by a factor of 4. And uh, so that means that this, this macromolecular complex is stabilized to a greater extent by having uh, SUR1 there than without. And this goes along with some of the other work that we won't really talk about of showing the role of SUR1 and TRPM4 in terms of enhancing the calcium calmodulin sensitivity of TRPM4. That fourfold increase with SUR1 is depicted here. Now, uh, so what, you might ask? Well, here's the so what on this slide. It turns out when you look at cell swelling, and these are, this is an expression system, we'll get to the S site in just a minute, but uh, uh, an expression system where you can study these individually and in different combinations. You see that when you have either the M1 or M23 isoform of aquaporin or TRPM4 by itself, or these combinations, you get a certain amount of cell swelling when you activate the cells with uh, A23187, which is a calcium ionophore. However, when you uh, add to the mix SUR1, you see that when you have SUR1, TRPM4, and either the M1 or the M23 isoform, you see a much more robust uh, and much more rapid uh, cell swelling. So these are working in concert with each other to promote cell swelling when this uh, channel is, uh, is being expressed. Uh, and this is how we envision these uh, individual molecules to be uh, uh, working together. These, uh, this cartoon, if you will, is uh, based on actual known uh, dimensions of TRPM4 and SUR1 and Aquaporin4 and the recently, and by that I mean just last year, described cryo-EM uh, a configuration of KETP, and we've substituted TRPM4 in the center here uh, in, in its proper size, and we envision that the aquaporin molecules are tucked into each of these uh, uh, corners as depicted here. So what is happening when this channel is open in the astrocyte cell membrane uh, is sodium is coming in, and there's almost immediate neutralization of that osmotic uh, force that is generated by the sodium coming into the cell. And the consequence, uh, as, as you can imagine, is cell swelling, uh, the consequence of that immediate neutralization of, uh, of the osmotic force. Now, we can... Uh, we can look at this uh, relationship between SUR1, TRPM4, and aquaporin 4 in vivo. And these are experiments, again, that Jesse did, uh, looking at the astrocytes in the, uh, in the uh, cerebellum. Uh, and uh, here, uh, real briefly, uh, our, our data showing that in vivo also uh, we have, uh, in, in this model, we have expression and upregulation of the three uh, uh, constituents, SUR1, TRPM4, and Aquaporin4. And, uh, and, and these are the experiments that were done uh, to demonstrate in vivo that the astrocyte swelling requires this uh, channel to, uh, uh, to be functional. So th these are uh, experiments in which he used this very fancy technique of dialistic labeling to uh, label the entire cell membrane of the astrocyte and then took a Z-stack, a uh, very fine uh, 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 pictures of, uh, of uh, throughout the entire depth of the cell in order to calculate the cell volume. And um, 
using this kind of uh, technology, he was able to show that in, in the wild type animal undergoing cryo injury, these uh, cerebellar astrocytes uh, enlarge in, uh, in volume, and that's depicted here. So in the wild type, there's a more than doubling of the cell volume uh, after this ischemic uh, injury. But in a knockout animal uh, with a knockout of TRPM4, uh, the cell volume does not uh, change appreciably after uh, uh, the ischemic insult. So the ischemia resulting in astrocyte swelling, for astrocyte swelling to occur after ischemia requires the uh, SUR1 uh, TRPM4 acoporin 4 macromolecular complex. So when you, the next time you go to the OR uh, to decompress a posterior fossa uh, and because uh, of swelling, because of ischemia, think that this is, this is why you're there, because we haven't uh, blocked this channel. That channel is there functioning, causing swelling of that posterior fossa, that, uh, that cerebellum. Um, now, it's not just posterior fossa and it's not just cerebellum. This is back to our uh, ischemia reperfusion and uh, reperfusion injury uh, conversation that we were having at the beginning of the talk. These are experiments that we did some time ago in which we were looking at six-hour ischemia followed by reperfusion. Now, this is a model that we developed in, uh, in, uh, in rats that is uh, really not used because it's a highly lethal model. And it's lethal because of the brain swelling uh, and the resultant mortality that, uh, uh, that come of it. Uh, here uh, it, uh, is uh, uh, depicted the neuro scores at 24 hours. Neuro scores are, uh, 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 go from zero to eight. Zero is normal, eight is dead. And you see that in this uh, cloud, uh, most of the animals are either eight dead, seven comatose. There are a few that are doing a little bit better. However, if at six hours, at the beginning of reperfusion, and this sort of goes to the heart of what we're talking about in terms of mechanical thrombectomy, if at six hours, uh, after uh, you know, re uh, recanalization, removing the, the occluder, if we uh, give glibenclamide and we look at the neuro scores at 24 hours, you see that one animal has died and the entire cloud has descended toward more normal values. Mortality here, was uh, 14 out of uh, 21, two thirds, similar to what you see in a large hemispheric infarction in humans. Mortality in the uh, uh, glibirite or glibenclamide treated animals was uh, 5%, one out of 22. The reason these animals are dying is shown here in panel C. You see this massive swelling of the hemisphere that occurs after six hours of ischemia followed by reperfusion. I should mention for those who may not be aware that if we don't reperfuse, if we leave the occluder in, those animals do well. They don't die. The brain doesn't swell. The brain only swells if you restore perfusion and you allow uh, edema to form. Uh, so uh, uh, a permanent occlusion is, is much less harmful than a prolonged uh, occlusion followed by reperfusion. The animals treated with uh, glibenclamide, glibirides swell a lot less. Here are quantification of those data, and you can see that the uh, swelling is reduced by more than half. These are the neuro scores in animals that were treated uh, either with glibenclamide at six hours or with decompressive craniectomy. So the only thing, as you all know, that we have right now for treating ischemia, reperfusion, brain swelling is decompressive craniectomy. We compared that uh, performed at six hours versus glibenclamide or glibiride at six hours. These are the neuro scores. You see that uh, the uh, the red are, are the DC, decompressive craniectomy animals. So they live, both treatments were equally effective at preventing mortality, preventing death. But in terms of neurologic function, the animals were that, uh, that had uh, glibenclamide instead of decompression were much better off in terms of these uh, neuro scores. The Garcia scores is another neurologic, uh, another measure of neurologic function in, in these animals. The scoring uh, is, is the opposite uh, in, in the sense that uh, larger numbers are better and you see that that's uh, uh, demonstrated here. So ischemia reperfusion, even in these uh, uh, models with six-hour ischemia, uh, is um, uh, the, the consequence of reperfusion injury are, are ameliorated with glibenclamide.
a couple of words now about this other aspect of uh, reperfusion injury related to hemorrhagic transformation and the role of MMP9. Uh, we've uh, been working on this project for some time. Uh, it turns out that when endothelium is activated, we talked about uh, uh, the NF-kappa-B upregulation, SUR1-TRPM4 channel upregulation. turns out that SUR1-TRPM4 uh, is opened by TPA. So TPA that we give to people to recanalize, at least in the era before uh, uh, mechanical thrombectomy, opens the channel, okay? And we're showing that here. Uh, you see that in a non uh, activated endothelial cell, TPA does nothing. There's no change in the inward or outward current. However, in an activated endothelial cell, a TPA opens the channel and the channel is blocked by glavenclamide or by 9-phenanthrol, which is a drug that blocks the TRPM4 subunit. Now, these same cells, these same endothelial cells, when they're activated and exposed to TPA, they secrete MMP9. And uh, this, we think, is closely tied to the whole issue of, uh, uh, of the fact that there's a very limited time window during which you can give TPA uh, after ischemia reperfusion. You all know that it's either three hours or four and a half, depending on a couple of different things. You go much beyond four and a half hours, and you have a higher likelihood of brain swelling and hemorrhagic transformation. But we think it's because SUR1 TRPM4 is being upregulated by that whole process, and the TPA is, uh, is uh, causing opening of the channel and release of MMP9. Um, the, uh, this this uh, uh, cartoon, if you will, depicts what we think is the signaling sequence uh, by the, which this is working. So uh, we have TPA, uh, which of course is a, an enzyme that is cleaving a plasminogen to plasmin. Plasmin then can uh, uh, cleave the uh, N terminus of the receptor uh, PAR1, uh, protease activated receptor 1. And, and then you have uh, an activated PAR1, which then goes through a G-protein coupled signaling, which allows through TRPC3 for calcium to come into the cell, which is important for uh, uh, secretion of MMP9. And this whole process has as a negative feedback mechanism, SUR1 TRPM4, uh, to limit the amount of calcium uh, uh, coming in. We think that this is the normal sequence. I don't have time to get into all of the details of this, but this was just published, uh, as you can see, earlier this year. So we think that uh, the channel is integral uh, to the whole MMP9 secretion by, uh, uh, by endothelium, and that uh, this relates and is relevant to uh, the whole process of, uh, of uh, uh, hemorrhagic transformation. Uh, in an animal model, we showed some time ago that uh, uh, in an ischemia reperfusion model, treatment with vehicle versus glavenclamide, glavenclamide reduced the amount of MMP9 uh, activity in the tissues by about half. Uh, and that effect was not due to inhibiting MMP9 itself, but due, we believe, to uh, the, the uh, release of uh, or secretion of MMP9 by the activated endothelium. And uh, uh, again, in an animal model, uh, and, and again, this, this severe model of six-hour ischemia uh, reperfusion uh, with TPA, given it a 10 times higher dose than what we give in humans, we see that these, these rats end up with a, uh, a very swollen hemisphere with a lot of hemorrhagic transformation, uh, as you might expect. Uh, but those given glavenclamide at six hours uh, uh, prior to the reperfusion uh, fare much better in terms of, of hemispheric swelling. Here's quantification of the hemispheric swelling here reduced by half and the hemorrhagic transformation scores uh, reduced and here's our neuro scores again and you see that overall animals who receive uh, uh, just the TPA don't do nearly as well as those who receive the TPA uh, as well as the uh, glavenclamide. Now, so, so that's our preclinical, uh, uh, basic science, preclinical, quick overview, a lot of stuff. Uh, but now let's, let's uh, look at how this translates into, into humans. And uh, so we'll, we'll start with a couple of retrospective studies that we did some time ago uh, in, uh, in humans. So the question came up, 
uh, and, and I wasn't smart enough to think about this. In fact, I wasn't that happy with doing the experiment. But the question came up, there's sort of a natural experiment, right? And the natural experiment is that uh, some patients with diabetes who happen to be uh, treated for the diabetes with uh, uh, a sulfonylurea, such as glyburide, and there are others, uh, what happens to them when they have a stroke, you know? Uh, and, and so we, we searched the world, literally, for uh, databases where we could figure out uh, 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 the fate of those patients. And the difficulty was in identifying database where there was good enough information on whether the patient stayed on the sulfonylurea after they presented with stroke. As you know, I think, at least in our practice, most of these patients come into ER, get taken off of PO medications after they present. And if they're diabetic and high glucoses and stuff, they may go on an insulin drift for a while. So the critical question was, do, do we know if they stayed on, on drug or not? And if they did stay on drug, what was their fate? So uh, it turned out that the best database was at Charité Hospital in Berlin, uh, Germany. And there, Hagen Kunter, who has now become a close colleague, uh, 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 did this uh, a retrospective analysis of their patients. And uh, lo and behold, what they found was that uh, there were patients who were on sulfonylurea and stayed on versus those not on sulfonylurea. In other words, their diabetes was being treated uh, either insulin or metformin or something else. The outcome measures here were NIHSS uh, of uh, uh, improvement of four or more or reaching zero. And um, it turned out that there was a, a significant difference between groups. That is, those who were on sulfonylurea ended up having uh, a, a greater degree of improvement, uh, more frequency, a higher frequency of, uh, of improvement of four points or more or reaching zero. And it turned out when we did a subgroup analysis of lacuna versus non-lacuna strokes, all of that benefit was in the uh, uh, non-lacuna strokes. So lacuna strokes... Not surprisingly, not a big deal with edema, right? These are small strokes. Uh, the non lacuna strokes didn't really benefit. Uh, they're, they're, there's no, uh, these are small vessel strokes. There's no perfusion injury there. The, the vessel just gets clogged, clogged off. Uh, but in the larger strokes, uh, that's where the benefit was. And uh, MRS of two or, or less, uh, again, that was uh, significant in this small group of patients. And then Hagen, uh, Kunta, did a second study of a different group of patients. So this was uh, a, another group of patients not included in this first analysis. And here the question was not simply outcome, but was hemorrhagic transformation. And this we published a couple of years ago in the annals. Uh, and it, it turned out that uh, all of the uh, symptomatic hemorrhagic transformations and all of the deaths were uh, in diabetic patients who were not in sulfonylurea. And the sulfonylurea patients had no hemorrhagic transformation and no death. Uh, so that was pretty dramatic. And in terms of any hemorrhagic transformation, by which we mean uh, uh, imaging evidence but asymptomatic, uh, there was a, a highly significant uh, difference there too. Um, and uh, the improvements in NIHSS and MRS also were significant, as you see uh, in this table. So, uh, retrospective studies, all of the caveats that go with retrospective studies, but two different groups of patients uh, and, uh, nicely characterized. So then we get on to prospective uh, studies, and there are two that we'll talk about here. Uh, the first was uh, called Games RP, and uh, I'm sorry, a Games Pilot, and the second one was Games RP. Now, uh, the only thing I take credit for besides the uh, basic science stuff is coming up with this, uh, this name game. So that stands for Glyburide Advantage in Malignant Edema and Stroke. And uh, I give uh, credit to the, uh, uh, the two uh, uh, PIs, uh, Kevin Sheth, who is now at Yale, and Taylor Kimberly, who is at uh, Massachusetts General. Both great guys. They led uh, both clinical trials and are involved, uh, fortunately, in the upcoming phase three trial that, uh, uh, that uh, should start uh, this June. So the first study was a small pilot study of 10 patients, open label, just to test uh, feasibility and, uh, and, uh, and to get a sort of a flavor for whether this would be uh, a, a feasible trial. 
And, uh, and the key here in the game studies is that the inclusion criteria were patients with large hemispheric infarctions defined as greater than 82 cc's uh, and upward of that, up to 300. So these are large infarcts. And, and that cutoff was based on uh, uh, first retrospective and then a prospective study uh, 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 done out of Germany showing that patients with infarcts of that magnitude were at high uh, risk for malignant cerebral edema. And that's what we were looking for, was the worst of the worst strokes. Could we prevent, like we had in animals, could we reduce or prevent the, the brain swelling that, uh, that was of great consequence? So in that first uh, study, 10 patients, large hemispheric infarctions, uh, Taylor uh, did this analysis um, uh, and uh, looked at the uh, uh, vasogenic edema as a T2 t- t- uh, flare uh, signal. And you see the flare ratios here. Now, the, the flare ratio, this, so this is a flare signal within the DWI lesion volume compared to the mirror uh, uh, flare signal on the uh, other hemisphere. So that's what the ratio is. And looking at these patients' uh, flare ratio in the control cohort, you see that the swelling, uh, the flare ratio uh, measure of, of swelling increases over time and sort of peaks at... Uh, at uh, two to three days. Uh, and the, the, uh, the flare ratio in the games uh, pilot patients, uh, uh, obviously the, the, there, was not, it, there was not an absence of, of edema, but it was significantly reduced. And when you looked at the uh, total uh, flare ratio in gray and white versus gray versus white, you see that there was a bigger uh, uh, difference or effect of drug uh, in the uh, gray matter compared to the white matter. And one of the interesting things that he found is it was almost a, a dose response. So the flare ratio for patient not on drug was uh, this value here, the highest value, 1.8 or, or thereabouts. Uh, and then uh, there were pharmacokinetic measurements of drug, and there were essentially patients with low levels of drug versus high levels of drug, and the higher the drug level patients had the, the better flare uh, ratios. That led to the, that was the phase, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the phase two pilot. That led to the phase two larger trial games RP. This was a um, multi-center uh, uh, study, uh, uh, 17 or 18 uh, centers. Again, the, uh, the uh, 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 admission, the, the baseline stroke scores, I'm sorry, stroke volumes were 82 to 300 uh, cubic centimeters uh, cc's. Uh, uh, in these patients as well. And it was important that uh, uh, these patients not have significant uh, disability prior to their stroke. They could have TPA up to four and a half hours, depending on, on things. And uh, they were uh, started on, they had to be started on drug before 10 hours. Now the 10 hour uh, window is something that we had determined uh, in preclinical uh, experiments that I didn't take the time to show you, but we did establish that there was at least a 10 hour window uh, for this drug. And perhaps that makes sense since, you know, swelling takes uh, longer to develop. Um, the, uh, uh, these are the characteristics of, uh, of these patients uh, that you see here. Uh, and the, it, it, at the bottom in red, is the mean DWI lesion volume at admission, uh, 150, 160 uh, uh, or so uh, cc. So these were these were large strokes. And importantly, uh, these were uh, uh, much larger than in the pilot study. So the pilot study, the mean volume was around 100 cc's. And on the basis of the pilot study, we designed uh, the, the Games RP study to have a primary endpoint, as I'll show you, of, um, of, 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 of avoiding a decompressive craniectomy and having a modified Rankin score of four or less. So what we had found in the pilot study is that even though these were all patients with large hemispheric infarctions, only two uh, were thought to need a decompressive craniectomy, which was uh, considered to be uh, less than what we would have expected for large hemispheric infarctions. So. Uh, uh, it turns out this was not a good way to design a primary efficacy endpoint for the phase two, uh, because it, it turns out that a lot of patients did in fact get uh, decompressive craniectomies, and that's of course because of us surgeons, right? It's four in the afternoon, huge infarct, I don't want to do this at two in the morning, uh, 
uh, I've got time in the OR, you know, all that kind of stuff that we all know happens. And so my, my colleagues let us down, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, the, so the efficacy endpoint end we didn't make in the games RP uh, study, as you can see here. And the reason, again, that we didn't make it is because uh, of this uh, uh, designation of uh, absence of, or not, no need for decompression in the primary. Safety was uh, not a concern, however. But there are other very uh, good signals that emerged from this uh, games RP study. Uh, and one was on mortality. So these are Kaplan-Meier curves here that you can see. Uh, the blue is the, uh, the glyburide, uh, intravenous glyburide uh, group, and the red is the placebo. Uh, and you see that this is an all-cause mortality. And so all-cause in the context of large hemispheric infarctions means that, you know, mother, uh, grandmother is, uh, you know, 75 years old. She had a good life. Large hemispheric uh, infarction on the left. Uh, just let her go, pull the plug. So that's not necessarily a neurological death. Uh, but, you know, I, I, not that it's wrong, but what I'm saying is it does uh, uh, go into the all-cause uh, death scenario. But when you looked at adjudicated neurologic deaths and adjudicated edema-related deaths, so these were blindly adjudicated by neurologists uh, who were uh, otherwise uninvolved, uh, you see that there uh, were significant reductions in, in both of these uh, adjudicated measures. Uh, and only one patient was judged to have had uh, uh, some uh, edema-related death, one out of 41 in the uh, uh, treated group versus eight out of 36. And I think the most uh, amazing thing to me that emerged from this study is depicted uh, in this lower uh, left-hand panel. So we all know as neurosurgeons that, uh, and it's well-established neurologists, every, we all know that uh, uh, with a large hemispheric infarction, uh, you can reduce mortality uh, by decompressing. Right, we we all accept that. It's 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 uh, uh, we all accept that. Uh, so, what we found here is that in the placebo groups, in fact, there was a, a noticeable reduction in mortality with decompression. So the bright red is placebo, no decompression, and the pinkish is the reduced mortality with decompression in the placebo group. But look at what happens in the patients uh, on the glyburide side. There's no effect of decompression. Uh, so mortality is lower overall, uh, as I showed you in the all-cause and so forth, but there's no effect of decompression. So these patients who are going to the OR, again, for radiological, not neurological reasons, and uh, they were getting decompressed, but it had, has no effect on mortality. So that to me is striking uh, that, uh, that there would be no uh, improvement in death. That means if you get drug, uh, that's as good as it gets, at least right now as of you know, 2018 or whatever, that decompression doesn't add uh, to outcome. And this is the uh, modified Rankin, uh, the shift, as you would expect, the reduction in mortality by nearly half, 36 to 17. And then every other category in the MRS is shifted uh, uh, in an appropriate way. There are even some patients who, now again, these are 82 cc's or larger. These are large hemispheric infarctions that are doing remarkably well with MRSs of one and two. Um, so that this was published a little over a year ago. Other measures are very encouraging from this. Two other measures. One was the midline shift. So we all know that midline shift is one of the best measures. It's kind of been around for a long time, but one of the best measures we have for brain swelling, one of the best predictors of how patients are going to do. Uh, this was from a paper published by uh, Ropper in uh, 87, uh, looking at neurologic function versus midline shift. And the red line is placed by me at seven millimeters. And you see that patients uh, who have uh, uh, midline shifts of, of seven millimeters or less uh, tend to do okay. They're awake. They may be drowsy, but they're okay. Uh, those with uh, greater shifts are stuporous or comatose, right? So seven is kind of a good number to, uh, to think about. Uh, and uh, we measured midline shift in uh, Games RP study, and these are a couple of images uh, showing that. And uh, this, uh, you can see the red lines are at the midline, and you can see the the, the blown up part. This is a treated patient and placebo patient. Uh, but the overall numbers are, are shown here. Uh, 
Uh, the average midline shift was uh, a little under five millimeters in the glyburide group and uh, eight uh, to nine millimeters in the untreated group. So a significant, highly significant, look at all the zeros after the, you know, in the P there, it's highly significant reduction in midline shift measure of uh, brain swelling in, in these patients. The, uh, the other thing that emerged was this story on MMP9 that we developed at the preclinical level and that I showed you. And uh, this is depicted here. So what was neat about this uh, uh, picture here is that the MMP9 for both groups started out at exactly the same level, a little over 400 uh, plasma uh, MMP9. Uh, the, uh, the, the patients in the placebo arm uh, uh, had uh, their next measure of MMP9 actually went up before they started to gradually taper. But the uh, patients in the, uh, in the drug group had an immediate uh, response coming down and then slowly tapering. So I showed you earlier our preclinical evidence that we're reducing or preventing secretion of MMP9 from activated endothelium. Uh, there are other sources of MMP9 in the ischemic brain, uh, and I showed you only the one related to endothelium, but there's an immediate biological effect of the drug on MMP9, which is uh, quite striking. And uh, this was, uh, again, significant, the reduction in MMP9 uh, with clavenclamide. So back to the slide that I showed you earlier, is there, and the question that I asked earlier, is there a role for SUR1, TRPM4 in any of these aspects of reperfusion injury? I, I hope that in the, in the last uh, several minutes, I've shown you that at both the preclinical level, uh, in terms of edema formation, MMP9 secretion, hemorrhagic transformation, uh, as well as in the clinical uh, trial data that we've uh, accumulated thus far. Uh, the answer to this, at least in my view, is yes. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, this program, the stroke program, was developed by a company called uh, Remedy Pharmaceutical, uh, who developed the IV version of the of, of glyburide. And that asset was uh, picked up or purchased by, by Biogen a little under a year ago. Biogen is now... Uh, uh, about to start a phase three trial, I believe this June. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, 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 Kevin Taylor, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Kevin Cheth and uh, Taylor Kimberly are uh, the principal investigators of that trial. And we expect uh, to enroll patients from uh, all over the world, Europe, uh, North America, including Canada, the US, of course, uh, and uh, Australia, uh, Japan, uh, uh, in this uh, in this big uh, phase three trial. And hopefully within a few years, we'll have some idea whether the story that I've told you today uh, can get on to a successful phase three that would lead to uh, FDA approval of the drug. So um, I leave you with one thought. Uh, I showed you this in the animals. I believe it's true in humans. It's better to uh, prevent brain swelling than to decompress the already swollen brain. Uh, any questions? That, that was uh, that was really great. I enjoyed that a lot. Yeah. Can, can, 